Hi, this is Stacey Chalemi, founder of the Complete Herbal Guide. And today I'm very excited because we have um, Igor Klevenoff here today, and he is a fitness trainer and he specializes in in um, chronic illness and hormonal imbalance. And we're going to talk about that today. But before we begin our conversation, I just want to make a shout out to our sponsors. And our sponsors, Resync, have two products they just launched, and it's Resync Collagen Peptides. And Resync Collagen Peptides support circulation and strengthen every layer of the body. It contains ingredients like vitamin C and mineral copper to build collagen and also reduces muscle soreness, and it also supports joint mobility and comfort. And they also have another product called Resync Recovery. And Resync Recovery supports the blood flow and circulation. It's the number one nitric oxide booster taken by professional athletes. It helps address inflammation and positively impacts the, the inflammatory markers. And it also helps you to gain energy. So I'd like to say thank you, um, Resync, and you can find Resync uh, products at resyncproducts.com. So Igor, why don't you tell me a little about yourself and what you do? Sure. Um, my name is Igor. <laughs> I'm the author of eight books on exercise and nutrition, including three bestsellers, Osteoporosis Reversal Secrets, High Blood Pressure Reversal Secrets, and Type 2 Diabetes Reversal Secrets. And the main reason I wrote these books is because I'm a personal trainer, uh, who specializes in those three conditions, plus uh, one one that I haven't written about yet, which is osteoarthritis. Um, my other big specialty is menopause and hormonal repair. Uh, my next book is actually about menopause. Uh, and that's how I got to working with uh, the folks that I work today. Oh, that's amazing. Now, um, when, you know, there's so many people, especially as we get older, um, you know, people develop different chronic illnesses. Is there any preventative methods that you suggest before people start to get into those ages where they develop chronic illness or any type of illness? Can they do things when they're younger to prevent illnesses from uh, coming on to, to, into their bodies? Uh, so it, it largely depends on which illnesses we're talking about. Um, and I mean, I'm a very optimistic person in general, but I should I should also be realistic. I should say that not every chronic illness can be prevented. There there are different genetic contrib contributions to different yes. illnesses. For example, some illnesses are 100% genetics, and there's nothing you can do with environment to prevent them. Others are like 98% environmental, and there's a lot you can do to prevent them. Um, so I don't want to talk about illness in general, but I can talk about the illnesses that I write my books about, um, which is the big four, the, the type 2 diabetes, the high blood pressure, um, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis. Almost all of them are like 90 plus percent preventable with just doing good stuff when you're younger. Now, what type of suggestions or tips would you say to individuals to help prevent those uh, chronic Ill illnesses that you just mentioned from coming about? The, the few commonalities between all of them is just sleep well, whatever that means, uh, right quantity, right quality, eat well. Um, and eating well is, fortunately, there's not a way to eat for blood pressure versus diabetes versus osteoporosis. Um, the bare basics are the same, which is eat the right number of calories. And we can get into a whole other discussion about what's the right number of calories. But, uh, but as a general rule, eat the right number of calories eat adequate protein, which again, which again brings to the question of what's adequate protein, um, and then eat lots of fruits, vegetables, and fiber. Um, if you cover all three bases, you'll, you, you, you won't have to worry about, about um, diabetes, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis. And the last piece, not to say that it's the least important, it's actually very, very important, is exercise. Um, three to six days per week of a mix of cardio and strength training. What's the right mix? Again, we can get into that discussion later, but there should be some kind of mix. Now with diabetes, um, you know, a lot of times, uh, a lot of doctors will refer to um, fruit as uh, candy because a lot of it converts into sugar. So are there certain fruits that diabetics should stay away from and certain fr fruits that are very good for diabetics? Uh, no, there's nothing that diabetics should stay away from um, in the fruit category. There are a lot of misconceptions about fruits for diabetics. And that's why the first chapter of the book, of every book I write, is dedicated to myth busting because there are so many myths about these things. Yes. One of the biggest myths is that because fruits are sweet, they shouldn't be eaten by, by diabetics. Um, and this myth shows a, uh, a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding about what sugar is. 
sugar is actually not one thing. Sugar is three things. It's glucose, it's mm -hmm. fructose, and it's galactose. Um, and glucose, unsurprisingly, raises blood glucose the most and the fastest. Fructose does not raise blood sugar to the same extent or by the same speed as glucose. Fruits, unsurprisingly, are mostly fructose. So that's reason number one, where fruits are fine for diabetics. Ah. Reason number two is because they are a high, rich source of fiber. Uh, fiber really, really helps with blood sugar regulation. Um, if for weight loss, the most important thing is calories. For uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, the two most important things are total calories and total fiber. Okay. Um, and diabetics have actually higher requirements for fiber compared to non-diabetics, whereas oh, a really? non-diabetic needs between 24 and 38 grams of fiber per day. A diabetic needs between 35 and 50 grams of fiber per day. And fruits are a great source of that, especially dried fruits. And that's kind of where the biggest misconception comes from, which is dried fruits are sweeter than yes. non-dried fruits. Uh, mm -hmm. Therefore, they shouldn't be not true at all. Um, and I, I like to base my 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 suggestions, my information, not on, yeah. you know, articles and other books or videos on YouTube or TikTok. I like to go right. to a medical journal. That's I like to why. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I like to read about experiments where researchers gave diabetics fruits, dried fruits, and saw what happened to the blood sugar. Rather than having to conjecture or, or try to guess what's going to happen or theorize, see what happens. So okay. there was one study that I, I put in my book where type of diabetics were given raisins three times per day, 50 grams, three times a day for three months. And one group of diabetics wasn't given raisins. They ate the, the exact same thing. Same number of calories, same protein, carbs, fats. The only difference was raisins versus no raisins. Um, and after three months, the group of diabetics that didn't get the raisins, their blood sugar was higher. The group of diabetics that got raisins, their blood sugar was lower. A tiny bit lower, not a heck of a lot lower, but better than the group that didn't receive raisins. Um, and there's also studies on dates. There are studies on fruits. There's studies on dried apricots. By and large, uh, between 50 and 150 grams of, of, of fruits, even dried fruits, are perfectly fine and to some extent beneficial for type 2 diabetics. Oh, really? You know, it's yeah. so funny that you say that because I just read a book and it was written by a doctor and he talked about uh, losing weight. And one of the things that he stressed was stay away from the fruit, the fruits, because fruit is like candy. And he yeah. only suggested like apples. And he suggested, I forgot what the other fruit was, but only a handful of, of the other type of fruit. And I was like, oh, you know, and because, you know, you hear about so many other fruits that are supposed to be so helpful and, you know, and yeah. healthy for you. And it was like, it was like a total contradiction, you know, so it was uh, very yeah. interesting that you say that. Yeah. When it comes to fruits, there's no bad fruits. They're just good and better. Uh, but there's no such thing as bad. Um, I strongly disagree with the, with the um, author of, of that book. Yeah. Uh, for the simple reason that it shows a very large misunderstanding of what fruits are. Are they candy? They are nature's candy. There is big. There are big differences between fruits and candy. One of the biggest differences is, well, the type of sugar. Yeah. Candy is primarily glucose or high fructose corn syrup. Um, gotcha. Whereas uh, fruits are, well, largely fructose. That's the one difference. Another difference is candy has zero fiber. Fruits have a lot of fiber. Yes, they um, do. I mean, they range from not a lot of fiber. Like watermelons don't have a lot of fiber, but dates and prunes and dried apricots have a ton of fiber. Yes. Um, and most fruits are somewhere in the middle. Um, candies have zero, absolutely zero. The other big difference is micronutrients and phytonutrients. For example, watermelon, while not being rich in anything other than water, it does have, a, it's very rich in lycopene, which is a phytonutrient, very good for things like your eyesight, things like prostate for men and so on. Um, whereas candy has, well, candy by and large have zero phytonutrients, zero micronutrients. It's literally, literally just sugar and, and, and coloring and fruit syrup. Um, so I'm, I'm really surprised that came out of a, a doctor. Yeah. Uh, put his, he put his reputation on the line for something that incorrect. Right. And you know, I was surprised myself when I read that quote. And, uh, you know, like my father personally has diabetes and he, his numbers were high and so was his prostate numbers until he lost weight. Once he lost weight and he was exercising on a regular basis, you know, according to what he was capable of doing, his diabetes went back, his numbers went back to normal. 
And yeah. he said that he even feels more his mobility even increased the aches and pains. He doesn't feel them anymore, you know, because as you know, diabetes doesn't affect one part of the body. It affects every part of the body. It destroys everything in, in your body, including your eyesight. It, you know, it can, if it gets yeah. out of control. Yeah. By and large, type two diabetes is reversible in 80 plus percent of the population. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and your father is a testament to that. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, so, you know, I see in our society, we have a go, go, you know, society that is constantly on the go, especially in America, you know, everybody is doing something, they're just grabbing something off the shelves, you know, a lot of people eat processed foods. And I think that's where the problem comes in is, is the, the lack of nutrition people are eating the wrong foods and not putting the right foods in our bodies because if your body doesn't you know recognize the food it's not going to be able to process it and they're, they're going to store it in your body and those toxins are going to build up now what do you suggest people do to keep themselves healthy you know like you said not all chronic illnesses are preventable by nutrition because some of it can be genetic and other factors can pl take place but what would you suggest to people so they can stay healthy and they can, you know, you know, live a healthy and sustainable life and even maybe increase their longevity? Um, what I would recommend is what I call the boring basics. So sleep between seven and nine hours a day at the same same bedtime at the right temperature. Um, that's that's the bare basics. Sleep is probably the most important thing. You have to figure that if you if you if you live to the age of ninety, you're probably going to spend thirty years asleep. Right. That probably means it's very, very, very important. So that's number one for, for overall health. Number two, and this is going to be a little controversial, I'm going to say exercise. Um, exercise is the next most important thing, uh, somewhere between three and six days per week, up a mix of cardio and strength training. Now, whether that's formal cardio and strength training, like going to the gym and actually doing cardio and strength training, or it's informal stuff like rock climbing or going for a hike, which is just cardio but not strength training, mm -hmm. um, or other things. Um, as long as you're active and active with exertion, yes, uh, three to six days per week. Um, and I, I emphasize with exertion because a lot of people say, I walk 10,000 steps per day. That's there's no exertion in that. It's yeah. good. I'm not saying don't do it, I'm just saying it's not getting it's probably not getting you out of breath, it's not making you stronger, it's not including improving your cardiovascular capacity because it doesn't cross the threshold, it doesn't get you out of breath. So, right. three to six days per week of something that gets you out of breath or challenges your muscles. Um, Walking is good, but walking is not enough. Um, and then nutrition. Um, eat the right number of calories along with the right protein and fiber. Um, and of course, if, again, we can't prevent everything. Some things are heavily genetic. Yeah. So regular screenings uh, for the stuff you can't prevent, you can at least treat it when it's early enough. Um, so those would be my, uh, my, my biggest factors when it comes to overall health to give yourself the best possible chance of having good health for as long as possible. Now I was reading that you like supplements. Like we all know that most people are lack vitamin D or magnesium. Are there certain supplements that you suggest to individuals that they should include in their daily regimen? Um, on a population wide basis, maybe just a multivitamin. Other than that, not really. There's a lot of con a controversy with even multivitamins. Um, although I have my reasons for recommending them, um, but. On, on a population-wide basis, maybe a multivitamin is the only thing I would recommend, not even vitamin D, unless proven deficient. Um, with all nutrients, as far as I know, uh, to go from deficient to sufficient is very beneficial. From sufficient to excessive is somewhere between ineffective and harmful. Um, for example, with the B vitamins, you go from sufficient to excessive, no big deal, you just beat them out. With vitamin C, you go from sufficient to excessive, you combination, you pee it out, or you get diarrhea. If you back off, you don't get diarrhea anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but with some things, there's outright harm in excess. So yes. calcium, vitamin D, iron, there's, an, there's a real big harm in going from sufficient to excessive. Um, so that's why even vitamin D, I don't tell everybody you should take it. I say, get tested first. Yes. If you're deficient, take it. If you're not deficient, don't take it because right. there are harms to excessive vitamin D. As I talk about in my osteoporosis book, there was one study done where men with healthy levels of vitamin D were given vitamin D supplements to put them above the reference range. And what happened is their, their bone density actually declined. Really? So it's interesting, yeah, that a vitamin D deficiency causes low bone mass and a vitamin D excess causes low, low bone mass. The body wow. is kind of like 
Goldilocks. The body doesn't like too little or too much. It likes just the right amount. So there is a risk to excessive vitamin D. Uh, one of those, as I just mentioned, is bone loss. Another one is kidney stones. Another one is soft tissue calcification. So right now it's very trendy to mega dose vitamin D. Um, and well, the trend is just, yeah, whether it's justified or not, I would say not without testing. Again, if you're very deficient, you can mega dose. Not forever, for a certain period of time until you're sufficient. And then either stop taking it or significantly reduce the dosage. Yes. And I've also experienced where if you take too much vitamin B, you can um, get achiness and soreness in your muscles as well, you know, from a, um, an extensive amount of vitamin B in your body. Well, with uh, with B6 especially, um, that's pyridoxine. What can happen with excessive uh, with excessive use? And let's let's just define this: how much is excessive? It's one hundred milligrams for six months. Right, now that's a really high dose. You don't really find it that in any one supplement. You'd have to take a bunch of different ones to right. get that much. Um, what can happen is neuropathy, that is nerve death. Um, yeah. But it's reversible if you just stop taking it. Um, as for the other B vitamins, um, most of them are fairly harmless. Uh, you just pee them out now. Does it cause muscle aches? It's probably not the B vitamins in themselves. It's it could be the other things they put in the supplements along with the B vitamins. Yes. Um, but yeah, you you can't go uh, get excessive in any of the other B B vitamins except for B six, which again you would have to take really high doses for a really extended period of time, and it goes away when you just stop taking it. Yes, you know, I was taking a uh, biotin, but it had a combination. It had a cocktail of vitamins in it. And I was yeah. taking it, you know, on a daily basis, but the vitamin B6 that you were mentioning built up in my system to a high level and actually caused muscle aches in my body. And as soon as yeah. I stopped taking that, that hair vitamin, the muscle yeah. aches went away. And yeah, there you go. Yes. It's a common, it's a common fallacy or flying thinking uh, by many, by, uh, by supplement manufacturers that if, you know, 10 milligrams of vitamin C is, if vitamin B6 is good, then a hundred milligrams is better. Well, again, not not really. The body is like Goldilocks. It doesn't like too little of anything, but not too much of anything either. It likes it just yes. the right amount. You have to be well balanced, exactly. And that Absolutely. also that also goes with um, hormonal, you know, balancing your hormones. People don't realize that your hormones are, you know, control our whole bodies. You know, it affects our whole bodies. And you know, I know that you're writing about. Um, hormonal balance and and menopause and you're talking about that and so many people you know go through that and they experience so many changes in their lives some overwhelming to to women now what made you so interested into focusing on this topic uh my clients i'm very interested in my clients and getting the best results for them uh by and large a lot of my clients are menopausal and postmenopausal women and i want to get really really good results for my clients not just decent results but the best possible results. Uh, so I want to research as much as I can to be able to provide a good service, um, not just a good service, but the best possible service anywhere um, when it comes to this stuff from a personal trainer. You know, I, I think that's a great, great perspective to focus on because, you know, for me, I went through menopause at a very early age. I started at 39 and my body completely changed. And I was going through, I was experiencing so many different types of symptoms. And at first I didn't even realize that I was going through premenopause because I was so young, you know, I wasn't yeah. the normal age. And, you know, I went on hormone therapy, you know, they did extensive uh, blood work at first to see what I was deficient in. And it was surprisingly, I had hardly any testosterone and I had hardly any progesterone in my body. But once they started balancing the hormones, they, um, I noticed within, within a three month period, a huge change. And I started to, all the symptoms started to go away and I started to actually feel even better than I felt before because my hormones were actually balanced, you know, and so what are you doing? You're writing a book about it. So what are you, what is your topic? What are you focusing on? What are the aspects in your book that are you, are you focusing on? I don't have a title yet, but it is about menopause. Um, it is about how to be healthy after menopause. Now, a lot of women think I want my pre-menopause body back. And in, in the book, I explain why, why that may actually not be desirable. Yes. from an aesthetic perspective, but from a from a health perspective, the extra 10 to 20 pounds may actually be beneficial and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, the longest living people are not the ones who have a BMI, a, a standard BMI of 18 and a half to 
Yeah. The, the longest living people are those with a BMI of slightly overweight, 27, 28. Um, now, again, Goldilocks, the body doesn't like to be too light or too heavy. If somebody's obese, that's not good. But if somebody is, has a BMI of less than 18 and a half, that's no good either. The body likes a BMI of a 27, 28. So it's actually beneficial, desirable, and healthy from a health perspective for a woman to gain as much as 20, 22 pounds during menopause. Uh, because before menopause, the three organs that make estrogen are the obvious, which is the ovaries. But the less obvious are the adrenal glands and body fat. Mm -hmm. Of course, during menopause, the ovaries don't make estrogen anymore. So the job falls on the adrenal glands and the body fat. And so when women do gain a little bit of body fat during menopause, uh, they actually have more estrogen and all the benefits that, that come with more estrogen, which is lower, lower risk of heart disease, lower risk of cancer, lower risk of a lot of other things, but also fewer hot flashes, better skin quality, better mood, better hair quality, um, better sleep, and so on. All these things that women compare, uh, complain about during menopause um, could be relieved to a great extent by just getting some body fat, like not even muscle, not even bone, but outright fat. Now, they might not like the way it looks, but they'll feel better. They might be, they, they could stay lean, but experience, you know, 20 hot flashes per day, or they could gain some body fat and experience four hot flashes per day, or maybe no hot flashes. Right. Now, um, what do you suggest? Do you suggest any type of supplements or do you suggest anything to help people when they're going through menopause and they're experiencing, you know, different types of symptoms? Um, yeah, so supplements are recommended on a case-by-case -case basis. We think of menopause as just one thing, as just an estrogen deficiency, but that's not the case. There are actually 12 different profiles of menopause based on the interactions of estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone. Some women have normal estrogen, but high testosterone, low progesterone. Some women have normal estrogen, high testosterone, high progesterone, and there's variations of these three. Um so there's 12 potential menopausal profiles. So I can't say that every menopausal woman should be taking this supplement because there's 12 different profiles. Exactly. So based on her profile and other factors, like what else happened during menopause? Did her thyroid take a beating? Uh, did her blood sugar get high? Um, so based on each person's individual profile, that, that's when to recommend supplements. So I can't say that every single menopausal woman should be taking this, maybe just a multivitamin, but but any anything above that would be on a case-by-case -case individual basis. Uh, the, the, th the three things that I, re that I can recommend to all menopausal women and all people in general, and I hate repeating this, but the boring basics, uh, sleep, exercise, nutrition. If, uh, if these three things solve 80 to 95% of every health problem. <laughs> so how do you think um, a person that's going through menopause, is there a certain way they should be uh, focused on certain foods or nutrients or is it? Well, the, the two things that uh, that I think are common to almost every, the three things, the three things that are common to everything are calories, protein, fiber. As long as they have those three things dialed in, they are they, they will be just fine. Calories as a rough marker, um, again, this is very, very rough, is multiply your body weight in pounds by about 16. And that's your calories for maintenance. So if you want to maintain your body weight, you eat your body weight in pounds times 16. Now, if you're going to lose weight, of course, you do a little bit less than that. If you want to gain weight, you do more than that, of course. Um, that's that's the calories. As for protein, it's about, depending on the on, on, on a person's age, people um, over 60 need more calories, sorry, more protein than people under 60. But somebody who's under 60 needs about 1.6 or so grams per kilogram per day. Somebody who's over 60 needs about 2.2, 2.4 grams per kilogram per day. Um, and they're thinking, well, I might, I might not be exercising. I don't need to be an Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't want to be super muscular. Protein, yes, it helps you with your muscles, but it also helps you with your bones, with your hormones, with your hair, with your skin. So if you want nice hair, skin, and nails, eat your protein. Uh, after all, a lot of women supplement with collagen. What do you think collagen is? Collagen is a protein. Yes. Um, right? Um, so that's adequate protein. And as for adequate fiber, if a woman is not diabetic, she needs between 24 and 38 grams of fiber per day. If she is a diabetic, as I mentioned earlier, 35 to 50 grams of fiber per day. As long as you have those three things dialed in, you can have whatever else you want, as long as it fits your caloric budget. You want to have a piece of chocolate? Go for it, as long as it fits your caloric budget. You want to have a slice of pizza? Go for it as long as it fits your caloric budget and as long as you've already met your protein and fiber requirements. Right. 
So basically, you know, you could have, you can eat certain foods that you like, as long as it's in moderation, you know, so you can incorporate foods into your healthy diet, as long as you don't go overboard and constantly, you know, have these type of foods and make it the majority based of your diet. Exactly. Like there's no foods that are off limits, unless of course you have an anaphylactic reaction to them, then you probably don't want to eat them anyways. Right. <laughs> um, but, but other than that, nothing is really off limits. Um, Again, as long as you meet those three requirements of total calories, total protein, total fiber, you can have whatever else you want as long as you know you, you meet those criteria. Now, with women that go through menopause, a lot of them experience uh, chronic fatigue. Is there anything yeah. you suggest for chronic fatigue that could be helpful for women who are experienced in this during menopause? Yeah. Uh, so chronic fatigue is a, is a symptom. It's not a diagnosis unless right. there's chronic fatigue syndrome. Yes. Uh, but I, I think we're not, we're not talking about that. Right. Um, it's just chronic fatigue with not chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. We have to figure out why she's getting fatigued. Uh, so there's, again, there's no one thing that you have fatigue, therefore take this. We have to understand why is there fatigue. When somebody complains of fatigue, there is about four or five things that come to my mind. Uh, the first four or five things I'm thinking about are low iron, low B12, slow thyroid, sleep apnea. So first of all, get tested for all of those, rule them out. Um, and, if, and maybe you find that, or maybe you're thinking, I'm, I'm in a puzzle, I'm not menstruating anymore, I'm not losing blood on a regular basis, I probably don't have anemia or low B12. Well, if you had anemia or low B12 when you were premenopausal and you never got it taken care of, you'll still be anemic or or have low B12 when, you, when you're menopausal. So get that corrected now. Right. Uh, if you couldn't can, can do it when you were younger. Um, for about 27% of women, their thyroid takes a beating when they go through menopause. Yes. So you have a thyroid tested. Yes. Um, but don't assume you have a slow thyroid just because you're menopausal. Again, so if 27% of, of menopausal women have a slow thyroid or a subclinically sl slow thyroid, uh, that still means 73% of them don't. Uh, right. So don't assume, get tested. Um, and lastly, sleep apnea. If it's chances are if it's it's one of those four things that's causing the, the the fatigue. Now, if it's not one of those four things, do some more thorough testing. Look at the estradiol, at the testosterone, the progesterone, the thyroid, uh, the um, uh, blood sugar, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, insulin resistance can cause fatigue, and so and, and and these things. So, if you have a family history of diabetes, it might make sense to get tested for you, your HbA1c, your fasting glucose, your C peptide, and fasting insulin, um, and a number of others that I've mentioned in my diabetes book. Um, but at the very at the very basis of it is just go get your annual physical, get get your very basic test and see what's going on with your body. And I, you know, for me personally, I went to a functional medicine doctor and they gave me a a, a thorough blood work of every they checked out everything. So they were able to see where I was deficient, you know, and what was causing it. And they were able to have an analyzation of what I needed. And like you said, I had a sluggish thyroid, I had an imbalance in certain hormones, I was deficient in certain nutrients and vitamins. And you know, they were able to figure out how to balance them. But like you said, you can't be your own doctor sometimes. You have to get get thorough blood work done so you know exactly what's going on. You can't guess. You have to, because each individual is different and everybody needs yeah. a different type of personalized program according to how their body functions and what their body needs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I always say, if you're not assessing, you are guessing. Yes, because a lot of people think they read articles on the internet and they think, oh, this is going to work for me, but they don't realize everybody reacts differently because we all have different bodies and we all have different chemistries in our body and we react differently. So, you know, when it comes to the internet, like you said, we really have to figure out where the information is coming from. And we really have to do our research before we jump into taking a supplement or a vitamin. And now you see they're trying to sell hormones over the counter, which is crazy. Yeah. You know, so people have to really be careful. What's your intake about that? Yeah, um, and I guess it depends how tightly regulated these things are. I mean, one hormone has been sold over the counter for decades, melatonin. Um, but it's a pretty good sleep aid and for, for the most part, pretty uh, pretty harmless. I mean, there there are harms that come that you can come from it, but they're infrequent enough that it makes sense to sell it. Yeah. But you can also buy DHEA over the counter in, in the US and Mexico and other places. Not right. in Canada though. Um uh I, I disagree. I think you should be able to first get your DHEA tested mm -hmm. as well as the other things tested. Get your testosterone tested because testosterone is downstream from DHEA. Get right. other things like androstenedione, dialing, get project get get your pregnenolone tested. So you see it's not just one hormone. It's not quite as simple as 
my blood work shows I'm deficient in this hormone, therefore I should take that hormone. Right. You have to ask a deeper question of why am I deficient in this hormone? What happens before that step and after that step biochemically? Um, if you have the background in biochemistry, great, you can figure it out. But chances <laughs> are most people don't have degrees in biochemistry, so right. go get some to figure it out for you. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't think people should be supplementing with, um, especially hormones, because they can have serious downstream and upstream effects. Um, unless they have a the background to figure out what's it doing to them and you know tests before tests after and you know hormones can be very dangerous if you take too much of of any type of hormone you could be putting your body into complete danger of you know incorporating certain illnesses and 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 something cro really bad chronically to your body you know in opening yourself yeah. up to diseases that you know um that are are very bad yeah, exactly. Like, for example, it's 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 a common fallacy in thinking that if, if you know, this much testosterone or estrogen or whatever is good, then increasing that by 10 is 10 times better or by 100 is 100 times better. No, you can, but you can, this could be life-threatening. Yes, um, so exactly. To give, yeah, to give viewers or listeners a perspective of how little hormones, how, how little of a hormone you need to have an effect, the body makes the equivalent of one teaspoon of testosterone per year yes isn't that it's amazing a, yeah it's a, such a tiny amount it is it has powerful effects so if you're going to take like five milligrams of like testosterone or estrogen or anything else five milligrams is a third of a teaspoon it's what you would get in four months wow. of natural pain. so it's not something that i would be I, I would be taking over the counter yeah and i've even seen it affect people's mental health when they have abused, you know, taken different hormones and added it into their bodies. It not only affected their body, but it affected their, their chemistry in their brain and the way they were thinking. And they, you know, they got a little loopy because, you know, it was affecting their mentality as well. Yeah. Well, we have the nervous system, but we have the latest system called, called the neuroendocrine system. Mm -hmm. That means that hormones affect the brain, but the brain also affects the hormones. So, yeah, well, what we think about can affect our, our hormones, not just cortisol, but others. Uh, but also our hormones can affect what we think about. Yes. So it's something that you really needs to be monitored carefully by a doctor. You know, so it's not something that you should take over the counter. And I just want to make that clear because I've seen testosterone products, you know, supplements on the shelves, you know, and, you know, being advertised to people and being advertised in the fitness world in, in the USA. And yeah. you know, it's kind of scary and it's a little upsetting because if people don't realize how much, you know, these, these hormones can actually play on our body and that they really yeah. need to be monitored. Yeah. And we should distinguish between outright selling the outright hormone versus hormone boosters. Yes. Um, it's not the same thing. A lot of no. supplements that are marketed as testosterone are not actual testosterone. They are testosterone right. boosters. Right. They claim to be testosterone, but lots, by and large, the vast majority of testosterone boosters don't boost testosterone. Exactly. Exactly. And that's also another market employee. And so I want to know a little bit more about osteoporosis. Now, you, you talked about that in your book, and so many people suffer from it. Do you have any tips for people who are suffering from osteoporosis, what they can do to help make yeah. themselves feel a little bit better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, uh, this is my advice for everything. Get tested. Figure out what's your, not just your bone density, but bone, bone density is a good test, but it's not a perfect test. There's another test called the trabecular bone score. Um, and that can, in combination with bone density, that can give you a much more accurate picture of your fracture risk. Because it's not just about bone density. It's not just about looking good on a test. Mm -hmm. It's about the real life consequences of low bone density, which is the risk of fractures. Um, so what if your bone density was good, but your fracture risk was high? Well, that wouldn't be very good. But what if your bone density was normal, but your fracture risk was really low? That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, get tested. Uh, again, not just bone density, but also your trabecular bone score. Uh, now, if you've been tested and you know you have osteoporosis, start implementing strategies to reverse that. And in my book, because I'm a personal trainer, the three things I talk about are exercise, nutrition, supplementation. I stay within my school of practice. <laughs> <laughs> so on the, on the uh, and by the way, I'm not the anti-medication guy. I'm not saying don't take medication. Right. I'm saying I'm not a pharmacist. Um, therefore, I don't even research these things. Uh, but if you want to know whether they're good or bad for you, talk to a doctor or pharmacist. Um, 
And so with um, osteoporosis, on the exercise perspective, I divide exercises into three different categories. Category number one is prevention, so preventing falling. So that's balance training. The second category, broadly speaking, is minimizing the damage if you fall. And that, is, uh, and that I subdivide into two, into two further categories of strength training and jump training. So from an exercise perspective, these are the really the three kinds of exercise that people with osteoporosis should be doing. One, balance training. Two, strength training. Three, uh, jump training. Um, and I elaborate on the jump side of things um, in my book. Basically, you don't start jumping right away because it is a high-risk exercise, mm -hmm. but there are ways to get the benefits without the risks. Um, if you want, we can get into that later as well. Uh, so that's on the exercise side, so exercise side of things. And by the way, when I say strength training, a lot of women, because by and large, it's women who have osteoporosis, although it does happen to men. Right. Um, they say, yes, I already do strength training. I do body pump classes. Right. And, I'm, and I, I say to them, that's not strength training. That is cardio with weights. That's right. not bad for you. Cardio, cardio is great. Um, but it's not strength training. It's cardio with weights. It doesn't have the benefits of strength training. There's right. a way to strength train for bone strength, which is different than strength training for muscle strength which is okay. different than strength training for fat loss. So there's a very specific way um, for uh, to exercise for bone strength, bone mass, bone density, et cetera. So that's the exercise, exercise side of things. On the nutrition side of things, nutrition for osteoporosis is ridiculously simple. A lot of things that people said really matter, like calcium and vitamin D, don't really matter all that much. The one thing that matters the most, by far, by and large, is protein good old boring protein. Um, when I take the diary of the nutritional diary of a lot of my clients with osteoporosis and I ask them, write down what you ate uh, and drank for the last week. And I see, when I when I add it up, I see that they are so low in, in, in protein, bar none. Like I've never had a client with osteoporosis where I looked at their diet log and said, yep, you eat, you eat adequate protein. Like <laughs> almost kind of people eat uh, with osteoporosis eat low protein. Um, and that's sad because bones are made of protein. Bones yeah. are made of collagen. And what is collagen? Well, again, collagen is a protein. Right. So nutrition is ridiculously simple. Not necessarily easy because if somebody doesn't have an appetite for protein, uh, you've got to force yourself. But there are strategies to get enough protein in your diet to 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 offset that. Right. I've seen my, my clients, some of them have a, a like a 2 to 4% improvement in bone density in one year from just eating, an, not even a high protein diet, an adequate protein diet. So that's on the nutrition side of things. Um, and on the supplementation side of things, probably the two or three most effective things is type one collagen. Mm -hmm. Now, again, a lot of women will take collagen for hair, skin, and nails, and they think they have to have their bases covered for mm -hmm. bones. That's not the case because there are five different types of collagen. Yes. And different types live in different tissues. Hair, yeah. skin, and nails is type three, but it won't do anything for your bones. Bones are type one collagen. Other people take collagen for their joints, for their cartilage, for arthritis, but that's type two collagen. Right. That's, that's collagen. Type one is bone. So if, if you want uh, help with your arthritis, take type one collagen. Um, so that's one of the three most effective supplements for, uh, for, for, for osteoporosis. Another one, especially for postmenopausal women, is soy isoflavones. Um, because... The risk of osteoarthritis, uh, osteoporosis really rises after menopause because of the lower estrogen. So isoflavones help, help postmenopausal women improve the estrogen status. And the last supplement that can be very effective for osteoporosis is vitamin K2. Um, mm -hmm. Vitamin K2 is what they call a repartitioning agent. That means when you eat calcium or take it from supplements, where how does calcium know where to go? Should right. it go into bone or arteries? Well, we don't want calcium in our arteries. We don't want calcified arteries. We right. want nice, flexible, loose, loose arteries. We don't want calcified bones. The way calcium knows where to go is with vitamin K2. In the presence of sufficient K2, calcium goes into bones. In the presence of deficient K2, it goes into arteries. So those are the three most effective supplements when it comes to osteoporosis. Now, I'm sure that somebody's watching this and they're going, well, wait, you forgot about calcium and vitamin D. I didn't forget about it. They're just not effective for osteoporosis. In as, as far as it comes, when it comes to calcium, there are a bunch of studies that look not just at bone density. Again, bone density is not what really matters. Fracture risk is what matters. Right. And so when they look at fracture risk and not bone density, they see that calcium has zero impact on that. 
in one of the studies, in, in, well, not just a study, a meta-analysis in my book, what the researchers did is they divided women into four groups. Group number one consumed less than 400 milligrams of calcium per day. Group number two, 400 to 800 milligrams. Group three, 800 to 1200. Group four, over 1200. Wow. And what they saw uh, during the follow-up period is that there was zero difference in fractures between the group consuming under 400 and over 1200. In other words, calcium improves bone density without affecting fracture risk, which is not good. We want to affect fracture risk. What's the point of bone density to begin with? It's not just to look good on a test so you can get a check mark from your doctor. Yeah. It's to avoid fractures, right? Right. Um, but yet calcium improves bone density without affecting fracture risk. So that's why I don't include calcium either in the diet or mm -hmm. in supplements. I'm not saying don't, don't consume milk, don't consume cheese, do consume it if you like it, but don't, don't do it because it helps you with bone density because it, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, as for vitamin D, the reason that I don't include it is because that one is very conditional. As I mentioned earlier, to go from deficient to sufficient vitamin D would be very beneficial. Sufficient to excessive is not beneficial. Right. So, so I don't make blanket statements of everybody with osteoporosis should be taking vitamin D because some people shouldn't. Right. Um, I say get tested. If you're low, take it. If you're not low, don't take it because there you will do damage if you take it when you don't need it. Right. Very good point. Yeah. yeah. So that's those are that's kind of the wholesome approach to osteoporosis: exercise, nutrition, supplementation. Now, for elders who are getting older, they tend to shrink a little because they're, you know, the lack of, of um, is, is it calcium or is it bone density? Because um, their bones start to shrink as they get older and they yeah. get more fragile. And that's yeah. why a lot of people, you know, if they, you know, elders, if they fall, you see a lot of, a lot of people get hurt in their, in their hip area, they break their yeah. hip and, and so forth. Is there any suggestions for people who are older, um, think, you know, different things they could do or supplements they can take or, uh, foods they can eat that could actually, you know, help them strengthen their bones and, you know, help prevent, you know, breakage or shrinkage or fractures from occurring. Yeah, all the same stuff as osteoporosis. Okay. Eat adequate, yeah, eat adequate protein, um, exercise, especially strength training, proper strength training, um, and to a lesser extent, jump training, maybe after about six to nine months of strength training. And again, if you're not if you're not getting enough protein in your diet, get it through some kind of supplement, whether it's whey or casein or pea or rice protein, just get enough protein in your diet. Um, and you'll be surprised that even an, el an elderly person, how quickly they can reverse all these things. That's great. You know, um, yeah. now with, with people, um, uh, I I've noticed, um, like a lot of times, like we, we find that, um, when it comes to maintaining good health, because our body starts to, as we get older, everything we, we produce less and less and less. Now, by is it is it is is the magic three going to be helpful? You know, um, because we, we we become deficient in a lot of the things, you know, as we get older. So, is it basically focusing on protein and focusing on certain thing, exercise and certain things that would be very helpful for people as they get older? Bingo. Yeah, it's it's the it's the magic three. Um, the the boring basics, the the sleep, exercise, nutrition. Um, as long as you do it for a lifetime, you'll be. I mean, I can't guarantee it, of course, but you give yourself the best the best possible chance at being healthy into your nineties. Now there was two other topics, two other books that you wrote. Um, what was the other other two? You had um, I actually wrote eight books in total, but the other two bestsellers were my diabetes book and my high blood pressure book. Now, for people with high blood pressure, a lot of people suffer with high blood pressure. Is there yeah. anything that you suggest for people with high blood pressure, how they could naturally, you know, improve their high blood pressure and, and get it balanced back to normal? Yeah, totally. With uh, with all of my books, again, I'm a personal trainer. So what's within my scope of practice, exercise, nutrition, supplements. So let's break it down. Um, with exercise, yes, you should do strength training. Yes, you should do cardio, but there is one very simple, little known exercise that can decrease uh, blood pressure by as much as 15 over eight millimeters of mercury. And here's how you do it. You squeeze both fists with 30% force. You hold that contraction for two minutes. You relax for three minutes and you repeat it three more times for a total of four, okay? Um, and you do that three times per week. Now, if you do the math on that, that's four sets of two minutes. That's only eight minutes a day. And you're just squeezing your fists. You don't need to go to the gym. You don't need to even get off the couch. You can watch TV and squeeze your fists. 
uh, no problems. And this is one of the most effective exercises for reducing high blood pressure. Um, wow. Effective from a time perspective. Now, is it going to improve your strength? No, you're not contracting with enough force to, to improve your strength. Right. Is it going to improve your endurance? No, because you're not using large enough muscles. It's just your forearm muscles yes. um, that you're working with. Right. Um, so it's not going to improve your endurance either. Is it going to lower your blood pressure? Very, very likely. Okay. That's the exercise side of things. On the nutrition side of things, what I like to do with my clients is I like to give them a list, a long list of foods, and they can just choose one to include with each meal per day. There are different mechanisms mechanisms by which different foods lower blood pressure. One of the mechanisms is, is having high enough potassium. So I recommend a list of high potassium foods. So some, some of the things at the top of the list are dried fruits. So dates, prunes, dried apricots, sun-dried tomatoes, and so on. Below that is things like potatoes, avocados, bananas, sweet potatoes, and so on. Um, but there are foods that are low in potassium and still lower high blood pressure uh, for different mechanisms. For example, garlic is not that high in potassium, but is really good for high blood pressure. Same wow. thing with celery. Uh, foods in general that are um, what they call vasodilators, they open up blood vessels. Um, those, those can help. So that's things like spinach and beets. They contain nitrates, which has converted to nitric oxide, which opens up blood vessels. Um, and other foods that I would put into the diuretic category. These are water-based fruits and vegetables like melons, watermelons, cucumbers, and so on. Um, these are all fruits and vegetables that can help lower blood pressure by different mechanisms. Um, that's the nutrition side of things. So I would just have a client choose one food per meal to include with, with each meal. And I've had clients normalize their blood pressure in a matter of one to two months just really? by doing, yeah, just by doing either this alone or this in combination with exercise. Um, and the last thing I should mention, of course, it well, actually you know what second last thing I should mention is supplements. Some of the supplements most effective for high blood pressure, number one is magnesium. Um, but there's other things like uh, powdered green vegetables. So powdered greens, like greens plus, veggie greens, and so on, um, as well as nitrate vegetables, like beetroot juice, and so on. Uh, these are all examples of great supplements that have proven efficacy in lowering high blood pressure. With all of my books, uh, there's always a chapter on supplements. And the supplement chapter is divided up into three different sections. One section is proven. We know this supplement works in people. Not rats, not mice, not petri dishes, but people. Right. One section is unproven. There is no research on it. We don't know if it works. We don't know if it doesn't work. Then the last category is disproven. We know whether or not it works. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and so in my experience, only about 30 to 35% of the supplements on the market have proven efficacy in people. Not just a mechanism of here's how it could work, but we gave people... Uh, not rats or mice or petri dishes, we gave people this supplement and their blood pressure came down or their blood sugar came down or their bone density went up. So in my experience, only about 30, 35% of the, of the supplements on the market are actually proven in people. Um, a bunch of other supplements are either unproven or disproven and yet still make it into supplements, into formulations that claim to improve whatever health outcome it is. Um, so that's, that's the third thing. So we talked exercise, we talk nutrition, we talk supplementation. The last thing that I should mention, which I've been mentioning, but I'm going to mention it especially here, is sleep yes. with high blood pressure. Um, in the general public, sleep apnea, I think, is only about 15 or 20%. Okay. So only about 15 20, 20 or 20% of people have sleep apnea. In people with hypertension, it's something like 60%. Wow. Okay. Now, to take things a step further, in people with what's called resistant hypertension, sleep apnea is like 83%. Now, oh, what is wow. resistant hypertension? Resistant hypertension is when somebody is taking three medications for high blood pressure already and is still high. It, 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 the blood pressure fails to respond to the medications. In those people, 83% uh, of those people suffer from, from sleep apnea. And, where, and when their sleep apnea gets corrected by whatever means necessary, uh, their blood pressure gets resolved without any changes in medications. So I, I can't emphasize this enough that for blood pressure and blood sugar, sleep is paramount. I see so many people going on high blood pressure medicine and they have such negative responses to the money, the, the blood, um, high blood pressure medication, but they still take it because it's very bad for your body. It's known, you know, to have lots, lots of side effects on, on, on people, but you know, people sometimes have to take it because they can't get their blood pressure down, but you know, 
maybe they should look for an alternative or try, you know, to do it naturally because, you know, blood pressure, high blood pressure medicine comes with a lot of side effects and, and a lot of problems occur when people start to take it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, most medications have side effects, but not every person feels those side effects. Right. Sometimes 90% of people feel who take them a certain medication have side effects. Sometimes like 5% will who take a certain medication have side effects. There's, and that's what they call the safety profile. Mm -hmm. some, some drugs have a really, really good safety profile. For instance, metformin, which is used for diabetes and has been used for the last hundred years um, or so, has a really good safety profile. Um, in some some countries, you can even buy it over the counter. You don't even, you don't need a doctor's prescription for that. Whereas others, um, other medications, for example, chemotherapy medications, have serious side effects in almost one hundred percent of people. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to. Again, I'm not a pharmacist. I'm not a doctor. I don't want to lump right. all medications to one category, and and I don't want to say don't take medications when some of them are actually legitimately beneficial. Um, we just have to weigh the pros and cons. Maybe the an advantage of a medication is it lowers blood pressure. And when it lowers blood pressure, it also lowers the risk of heart attacks and strokes and so on. But the side effect, of course, is maybe if you it, it's not good for your vision, you know. Um, yeah. So pick which one you want to you want to live with. You want to go blind, or you want to die from heart attack. Some people would prefer to heart attack over blindness. So who knows? Right. Um, that's a personal call, um, and that's also also a professional call by the practitioner. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that there's benefits and drawbacks to everything. There's benefits and drawbacks to supplements. There's benefits and drawbacks to exercise. Everything has a pro and a con. Now you're a fitness trainer. So when people come to you and they're, they're suffering from chronic illness or they're suffering from some type of issue, you know, whether it be menopause or whether it be, you know, maybe, you know, being obese, you know, and, and wanting to lose weight, whatever the case may be, what are some of the things you do as a fitness trainer that will benefit people? Um, so it's, I, I, I feel like a large part of what I do is just improving compliance. Um, at the end of the day, fat loss is very, very simple. Um, all there, there's only two things that matter: total calories and total protein. That's it. That's fat loss. Weight loss is even simpler, which is total calories. Protein doesn't matter, but most people don't want to lose muscle or bone mass, so protein matters. Um, so those are the only two things that matter. Knowing that, again, all you have to do is you just have to pick a diet that's that that fits those two criteria. Whether you eat two large meals a day or five small meals a day, doesn't matter. Whether you eat after six or you don't eat after six, doesn't matter. Whether your ratio of carbs to fats, doesn't matter. The only two things that matter is total calories and total protein. Um, and so it's my job to figure out what can my client do that A, fits their, uh, that is healthy, but B, a lot of people neglect this, is tasty. Yes. Because if it's healthy but not tasty, they won't stick to it very, very for very long. Mm -hmm. If it's healthy but it's different than the way their family eats, everybody sits down at the dinner table and one person's eating differently. Well, that's not going to work, right? Right. Um, or if they work a certain job that involves a lot of travel, they, they might they might have this perfect meal plan, but their travel schedule doesn't allow to eat to stick to that meal plan. So it's my job more than anything not to tweak the finer points of nutrition. Um, which is really only relevant to a tiny percentage of the population. It's really about managing logistics, testing, tweaking, um, and seeing what works, uh, taking regular measurements. And if it's something is, wor is working, great, let's do more of it. If right. something is not working, well, let's change that. Yes. I think that's very important because a lot of people, you know, they, they, they want to improve their bodies. They want to improve their, their health and they want to feel good, look good. And they want to be able to do things that they weren't, you know, they're not currently able to do, but they once were able to do, but they just don't know where to begin. So someone like a fitness trainer could actually get them on the right track by examining the overall, you know, of what their goals are, what they need, you know, directing them into, into areas to find out the information you need, correct. And then you are able yeah. to put them on a program that will help their overall health and get their, yeah. accomplish their goals. Yeah, and to a great extent, it's about being non-dogmatic and non-judgmental because a lot of personal trainers treat exercise and nutrition like it's a religion. They're like, I'm in this camp or this is the diet. This is the best diet. This is the only diet for everyone. If you don't do this diet, you're going to fail. If you don't yeah. do this program, you're going to fail. It's about being non-dogmatic. And taking regular measurements helps a good trainer be non-dogmatic, which unfortunately is not enough trainers who take measurements. Right. Um, because let's say, you believe that a certain diet is perfect, is the, the the greatest thing ever, and then you take measurements of your client and they don't do well on that diet, it doesn't take very many clients who aren't experiencing success on this to change your mind. You're like, oh, maybe it doesn't work for this person. Maybe it works for these people, but it doesn't work for that person. Um, and it helps you refine your own ideas about what works and what doesn't. And the nice thing is, 
having met her thousands of people by now, I've been a personal trainer for almost 17 years. Um, I've seen that uh, you can get, you can get, there's a million different ways to get to the same end goal. It's right. just figuring out what's the one or two or three ways that work for you. Uh, you know, it, it bothers me so many times. They have so many of these fad diets and trendy diets that come about yeah. and people spend tons of money, you know, um, and they don't realize that it's it's simpler than they, you know, than they can imagine, you know, if they yeah. just be able to retrain their bodies and, and incorporate some, like you said, protein, a little exercise, eating the right foods and keeping your yeah. calorie to a certain extent. Yeah, exactly. And they use some kind of very obscure, very exotic sounding mechanism to explain the effectiveness of the diet. And I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, um, the singer Adele, she lost a lot of weight and she, popular, she popularized a diet called the CERT food diet, S-I-R-T, coming from the proteins known, known as sirtuins. And they are they, they're claimed to increase longevity and telomere length. Um, now, she, like they were claiming that this was the reason, the CERT food diet was the reason that the, that Adele lost a lot of weight. What they neglected to mention was that the CERT food diet, the CERT food diet was a 1500 calorie per day diet. Maybe that's the bigger reason why she lost weight. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Maybe it's not the sirtuins. Maybe it's the calories. <laughs> Maybe it's the calories. And that's what people have to really focus on is how many calories they're incorporating. Cause I don't think a lot of people, we don't realize how many calories we intake in a day. You know, if you don't really calculate it, you know, it, it's surprising how many calories you could actually intake and think you're eating healthy, but you're actually, you know, depending on, you know, the dressing you're putting on or what, what you're exactly. doing, you know, could be a lot more than what you expect. Yeah, absolutely. Like for example, a tablespoon of peanut butter, the label might say it has whatever number of calories, but it's counting a flat tablespoon, not a tablespoon with a mound on it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that can double your calories or at least increase it by 80%. And you're still counting it as just a flat tablespoon. Right. And, you know, before you know it, you, you've you incorporated way over the amount of, of calories that you, you're trying to, you know, incorporate in your daily diet in order to lose weight. So that, you know, nixes your whole day of trying to be good. You know, it's simple little things like that, like peanut butter or salad dressing, you know. Exactly. Simple things that add a lot to your calories, but don't add a lot to your satiety. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. They don't make you feel a lot fuller, but they do add a lot of calories. Yeah, exactly. Now, where can people find you? Uh, I'm very, very bad at social media, but I do have a website. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fitnesssolutionsplus.ca. And if anybody wants my books, they can get it on Amazon by just searching my name, I-G-O-R. And my last name is Klibanov. K-L-I-B-A-N-O-V, or to make things simpler, use my first name and then diabetes or first name and osteoporosis or first name and blood pressure. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So your your website is the main place to go. And if they want to find your books, Amazon will probably be a very good area to, to find all your books. On. That's right. They're all sold on Amazon. All right. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for coming on our show. Is there anything that you'd like before we end this show, anything you'd like to tell the listeners to keep in mind from all the topics that we we've touched base on? No, no, this was an excellent interview, Stacey. You asked very thought provoking questions. And I think the, uh, what the listeners can get, which I've been repeating over and over, it was the main message. Yeah. Do the boring basics, sleep, exercise, nutrition. Excellent. Yes. And that's so true. So true. I agree hundred percent with you. Well, thank awesome. you. Thank you very much, Igor, for coming on the show and providing us with such useful and productive information. And I really appreciate you coming on this show because I think the listeners got a lot of valuable information. And thank you for everything that you do. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on here. Uh, you're very welcome. You have a great day. You too.